Welcome. This yin yoga sequence will include postures such as half frog pose, sphinx pose, banana pose, snail pose, and bow tie pose. Useful props will be a strap for a shoulder warm up that we'll do at the very beginning of the practice. And then other props that might be useful is a sandbag for weight for banana pose. And if you have a yoga bolster, that might be useful during bow tie pose, which can often be a pretty, pretty intense shoulder opener. The theme for class will be the largest object known in the Kuiper belt, the outermost zone of our solar system. And it's the dwarf planet Pluto. This practice begins by finding a comfortable seat. So take your time to settle and really feel the contact points with however you're sitting with the floor or the chair or the cushion or the yoga mat or whatever you're using to sit on and allow yourself to root during in those points and then slightly tone through through your, your abdomen, your torso here, grow your spine nice and neutral. And then notice your breath. This is called finding your center, or finding your inner ground. And then just allow yourself to be here for a few breaths. And we'll stay here, we'll stay here for a while. Let go of everything that's happened today or what you think is going to happen in the future and allow yourself to just be in the present moment. That means you can notice what's going on around you. But I would, I would, I'm going to recommend maybe this visualization. So there has been only one spacecraft that has visited Pluto just a few years ago, the planet, the, the dwarf planet Pluto. And it was the spacecraft New Horizons. New Horizons did something very unique that has not been done often by spacecraft in order to traverse the huge distances between planets, particularly to get to the outer part of the solar system, to the Kuiper Belt. They put the spacecraft into hibernation mode, and that's the visualization here. For a few breaths, see if you can go into a hibernation mode. And what a hibernation mode is, is all of the extraneous functions of the spacecraft are shut down until there's nothing left, not even communication with the ground, except these very, very bare bone systems that are running to keep the spacecraft alive. And that's what we're trying to get at a little bit with meditation and with breath work. We're trying to shut down all of the extra thoughts that are going up up here for a while and, and indeed take on a mode of hibernation where all we're noticing are the things that are keeping us alive. Our breath is the most obvious one. Maybe some of you can actually feel your circulation when it's peaceful and quiet. And that's, that's what I'd like you to do. What's your, what's your version of hibernation? If you were a spacecraft and your technique to traver, transverse large distances in the deep darkness of space, what would your, what would your hibernation mode look like here? And then slowly at some point, you start to re-engage all the systems in your being. You're starting to wake up your spacecraft here and bring yourself back and bring yourself online. And you can move slowly. You can again sense the things around you, 
We'll get started with a little bit of a warm up here. I call this, you can think of this as a systems check to make sure all the onboard systems of your spacecraft are working. In this case, we'll practice a, a shoulder a shoulder exercise. So this is where we need the strap. If you don't have a strap, you can just do shoulder rolls here, where you just roll your shoulders in big circles in one direction and go in the other direction. But if you do have a strap, take the strap, clasp the middle of it with your hands with about a foot in between your hands and then extend your arms forward, slowly lift them up. Pause when you get your hands right over your head and grow tall through your torso and your arms. So arms really long here. And then slowly lower the strap in the arms behind you. And if you have to, you know, you wanna keep the strap taut and your arms fairly straight. That means you'll probably have to slide your hands away from each other until, you're, until you can actually get slowly get your arms down behind you here and then slowly raise everything up kind of keep the strap top arms hands are holding on tightly to the strap and then bring it up and over and we'll do that about three more times now you can keep your hands where they ended up you can start over and then just grow up tall here when you get up high and then experiment to see how much, how, how far your hands are apart so that you can just get the strap down. Now we're going for traction in the back of the shoulders, but not pain. So if you're not feeling anything, maybe a little bit more oomph, hands a little bit closer together. But if it is painful, that's too much. Maybe let your hands slip apart a little bit farther. So we do another cycle here. And you can do this many times as you want to. In fact, I'd recommend getting some sort of a, a belt or a strap and maybe do this several times a day, particularly if you work in an office envir environment, sitting at a chair for long periods of time. Okay, we're done with the strap, so we can put the strap off to the side. Let's try some side twists here. So hands on either side of your torso, inhale and reach your arms up way long here. So you're not only growing your arms long, but you're growing your torso long from the, from the tip of your tailbone to the crown of your head and then up through your arms and your fingers here. Exhale, lower your arms and begin to twist to the right side. So the left arm rests on your right thigh, right arm right behind your torso here. Maybe use an inhale to create space in your torso and then use the exhale to see if you can go a little bit deeper without too much strain. This is a warm up. This is not yoga Olympics here. So you're just going to that stopping point and maybe staying there for a breath. And then you bring yourself back to center, hands on either side of your torso. Inhale, arms come up overhead, lengthen, and then exhale and twist to the other side. So same procedure here. Give yourself time to settle into the twist. Bring your spine back to neutral and then see if you can twist a little bit more deeply here. Again, you're finding your stopping point here and then just noticing how that feels. So head and neck can stay neutral if that's too strengthful on the neck to look over the back shoulder or look over the back shoulder if it feels fine. And then bring yourself back to center. Maybe you want to do a little bit of a counter twist here. And now we'll try a neck exercise, but maybe change your seat if you can. I'll, we, we can try just sitting back on our heels. Some of us can't do this. So if this is not looking good to you, just stay seated the way you are. Otherwise, come to sit on your heel or sit on a block or some books if you have some here. This is just a different way to sit. It's actually a little bit more symmetrical than cross-legged seat here. And then bring your hands and bring them and just rest them on your thighs somewhere here. Shoulders are relaxed, grow up tall through your spine again. Crown of your head's point up towards the ceiling. We'll try a neck exercise here. So just gently tilt your neck over to the right side, just as far as you go till it stops. Notice how this feels. Maybe it's intense. If it is, this is as far as you go. Step number two is if you want a little bit more intensity, take the left arm and just move the left hand down to touch the floor. This will very subtly lower this left shoulder and that might bring about some extra intensity in the neck shoulder region here. 
Breathe into that. Now, if you're still not feeling much, you can take your right hand, reach up and around, and just lay the right hand right next to your left ear. You don't need to pull with your arm, just add the weight, gravitational weight of your arm to this, this whole system here. And that might be much, enough pressure. And if it's too much, if this is not painful, then release the arm or bring both hands back to your, back to your thighs. Otherwise, just, just stay here for one more breath. And then when you come out, if that was really intense, take your right hand, bring it on the other side of your head. Use your arm to tilt your head back up to center. Start out again from the beginning position here. Torso is slightly toning here, and then tilt your head the other way, again, just to where it stops, so over the, over the left shoulder. See how this feels. So you need to take some time here and actually feel this. Not feeling anything, you want to feel a little bit more, lower that right hand to the floor. Pause and see how this feels on your neck, arm, shoulder kind of area. And then if you're deciding you want more, then the left hand comes around and starts to put some extra traction here. And then when you've kind of found your edge, stay here for maybe one more breath. And then bring your head back up to straight, kind of release your arms. That was the warm up. So we'll get into the first long held yin posture that we're trying to reside in for several minutes here. And this, this yin posture is called half frog pose. So you'll come to seated, both legs out in front. And if you have a lot of tightness in your legs, maybe you sit up on a little bit of height. So I'm sitting up on a blanket, maybe you have a block or some books or a bolster to sit up on, or maybe you don't know any, need any of those things. It's just you and your mat here. So for half frog, Bend the left knee and bring the left heel on the outside of the left hip. The left knee can go out to the side to a few inches here. Right leg remains straight. Now it can be straight in front of you or you can move the right leg out to the side a few inches. So you're adjusting all of this for your own taste and your own body here. This is, this is the basic setup for half frog pose here. Now some of us might not be internally rotated enough for the knee or the ankle to really like this position in half frog here. So if you find yourself in pain here with this leg situated like this, an alternative is half butterfly. It's a different posture, but it's something useful to do. So this is internally rotating the hip socket. Half butterfly is with the heel towards the center of the hip. So this is half butterfly. It's an external rotation of the hip socket. And maybe it's less painful, but it is working different parts of the hips and the legs here. So choose, choose whatever, whatever you chose to do, maybe do that on the other side too, just, just, for, just for balance here. Now you can, hear, you can just stay seated here and half frog or half butterfly. But the next step, if you wish, is to add a forward fold to it. So my recommendation is to grow up tall, so we're doing a little bit of yang here, right? We've got muscles engaged to bring our spine to neutral. Hinge forward as far as you can, and then soften the muscle fiber. Release your muscles, allow your torso to round over this right leg. By the way, this right leg can be bent. It can be straight, if you can have it straight. If straight is too painful, knee is bent however much it needs to be bent here. And you can always put props underneath this knee to keep it bent here. You can also put props underneath your head and your torso when you're folding forward here. But you just slowly go forward, relax the torso and your the muscles in your torso to let your spine round until you just find your stopping point. And then that's where you stop here. So this is, this is all a detailed explanation of the first principle of yin practice, and that is finding your edge. Where do you go? How far do you need to go until your body starts feeling pressure, feeling tightness and stuckness? And where do you stop? What's your stopping point here? And it's different for each one of us. Each one of us has a different body. Therefore, our stopping points are different. 
And we're trying to explore, discover, and find those stopping points. Just like we send out space probes into the solar system to do, explore and discover details about the planets and the objects in the areas of our own solar system here, including things like the dwarf planet Pluto here. But we have about we have about one more minute on this side, and I always like to add that um, if one or two minutes is enough here, we're usually spending three or four minutes in a pose in these practices, but if one or two minutes is enough for you, then you come out and rest or do some counter maneuvers here. Notice your edge. If your edge of your mind has changed, maybe you can sink a little bit lower. Or maybe you have to come out because you are in pain. Second principle is called stillness. So once you've reached your edge, you give yourself permission to stay there. This is, this is what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to just be residing here and watching your edge, watching your breath. And then the first principle is time. Then we allow a certain amount of time to pass. Maybe, maybe each yin posture is, is kind of a mini hibernation session. So we're, we're exploring, but every once in a while, we need to just shut down all the extraneous things that are going on. Now we can't do that with our minds. So don't try. It's, it's like, it's kind of vain to try here, but we can focus. We can focus on, on the edge and that's that's part of the yoga practice is focusing on the present physical sensations here just one more breath here and we've spent enough time here so use your hands and your arms if you folded forward slowly bring yourself up to seated maybe maybe you have to do some twists to work out the kinks in your torso or maybe even a slight back bend, but probably your hip is in your legs in the half frog pose, or maybe saying they want to come out. So lean away from the bent leg so that you can, it's more easy to release it and then bring it forward and a little bit of motion here and rest to just notice how this whole system feels after it's brought out of the half frog, half frog leg here, a good counter, Posture is windshield wipers here. So feet feet on the floor, knees bent, feet fairly wide, and then lower your knees to one side, bring them back up to center, the other side. So that was an internal rotation. So the counter pose is the outer hip is now externally rotating. And maybe that relieves some pressure. Maybe not. Maybe you need to do something else. But we'll go ahead and get set up for the other side of half frog pose. So again, decide if you would like some padding to sit up on and then extend your legs out long, bend the right knee, bring the right heel on the outside of the right hip, right knee can go out to the side, left leg can be either straight or you can maybe move it out to the side here, kind of your, your preference, your choice. And Maybe you decide you want to do half butterfly instead of half frog. So by all means, try half butterfly on this side. You can just sit here and marinate in the hip and leg opener here. Or if you want to add the forward fold, same procedure. Just begin to fold over this straight leg any amount until you begin to stop here. Again, you're, you're moving slowly so you can find that edge. And then you just soften and you settle here. So a couple of decades ago, telescopes on the earth were getting good enough that they were, to, they were starting to discover more and more of these icy remnants that, that lived beyond the orbit of Neptune. Neptune is the last major planet in the solar system. And this led, led evidence, this gave evidence and proof to this idea that beyond the outer planets, beyond Neptune, lies this vast region of the solar system that has now since been named the Kuiper Belt. And it's a region, it's a huge donut region 
a donut shaped region that in, that encircles the inner solar system with these leftover icy objects from the very formation of, of the solar system. And what science has actually discovered is that Pluto is actually one of the largest, larger or largest, at least the largest known Kuiper belt object that's, that's out there. And it's one of the reasons probably why we discovered it so long ago. So Pluto, Pluto was discovered back in the 1930s. So it's almost, so almost a hundred years that we've known Pluto, about Pluto. And we've known about it because again, it's a pretty major object in this region beyond, beyond Neptune here. And in the late 1990s, early 2000s, we're starting to see with ground-based telescopes and particularly the Hubble Space Telescope, we were starting to find more objects in this region of space. So the objects are very small, they can be really dark, so they're extremely hard to see. It takes the very cutting edge of technology to detect it, but they're there. They're there and there's probably, there's probably billions if not trillions of these leftover hunks of ice, basically. Mainly ammonia, water ice, carbon monoxide, methane, just all these, all these icy remnants. And some of them have coalesced into larger objects, such as, such as Pluto. But there's other objects such as Sedna and Makemeke and um, Haimea and Eris. Eris. Eris is actually more massive than Pluto is, but is much smaller in diameter. And so what we've found, what we've found is this, this, this amazing expanse of creator material, material left over from the creation of the solar system, which can tell us a lot about how the solar system formed and ultimately how the earth formed and how we formed by looking out in this far reaches of space. So we're kind of done, kind of done with this, this side of half rod pose. So maybe take your hands and your arms, use them to lift your torso up if your torso was rounded forward here. And then slowly lean away from the half frog leg so that you can actually release that leg and bring it forward. And again, some small motions to maybe bring a little bit of feeling or blood back into that leg here. And like I said, I'm a big fan of windshield wipers. So maybe that's a nice thing to try for a few rounds as a counter pose. And then the next yin posture is Sphinx pose. So for Sphinx, make your way onto your belly. Legs extended out behind you comfortably. And then draw your elbows up underneath your shoulders, about shoulder width apart. And about is, to find what about shoulder width apart is, is clasp your elbows figure that one out here. And then you can leave your elbows clasped if that feels comfortable. Or hands can come out into sphinx arms or clasp your hands, or you can, can hold your head with your hands here. So a lot of different things you can do here. This is sphinx. Now the idea here is we're trying to set up a type of pressure in the spine. This time, instead of tension, we're trying to create compression. So we, we kind of relax all the muscles in the torso, let the spine sag. And for most of us, we feel a light compression in the lumbar and the sacral region of the spine, the low back here. And that's the point, Sphinx. If you're not feeling that, feeling absolutely nothing, I mean, it can come up into seal pose. Or you can put books underneath your elbows to bring them up higher here. Some of us feel too much here, so this is already painful, in which case draw your elbows forward until, until you find a, a nice place to be here. And then we'll stay here, we'll stay here for a little while in sinks. Lots of things to do with your head. You can just hold your head up, 
you can let your head hang or you can place a prop right here that's high enough to just rest your forehead comfortably on the prop here. I usually let my head hang when I'm in Sphinx. That feels okay for me, but for some of us that's a little bit too much on the neck. So you have to be your own judge, your own explorer here, and decide what's best for your neck here in Sphinx. And then check in with your breath. Maybe come back to this idea of this sensation of hibernation. So this is, this is your job right now, is to just stay right here. And there's nothing to do except stay focused on what your edge is doing. Stay focused on your breath. Stay focused on your internal sensations here. So Pluto is one of the farthest objects that we've ever visited with a, with a human spacecraft that has left Earth. And it took a long time to get there. It's Pluto's 30, Pluto is on average, so Pluto has a very eccentric orbit. So most of the planets have circular orbits, but the dwarf planet Pluto has an eccentric orbit that changes with its distance to the sun by about a billion miles here. But its average distance from the sun, well beyond Neptune, is about 3.7 billion miles from the sun. That's so far away that it takes light five and a half hours from the sun to reach Pluto. And in fact, the amount of sunlight that Pluto receives is almost one thousandth that of what Earth's received. So very, very little light. In fact, there's a basically no, no, no heating effect at all. Maybe I need to digress here a minute and talk about Earth. So a lot of the energetic systems on the surface of the Earth are driven by heating and energy from the sun, since we're so close. We're only 93 million miles from the sun, as opposed to 3.7 billion. So almost all of the energy resources that we see here on the surface of the earth come from the sun although the earth itself has a heated core and a lot of that heat comes up from the earth's core so there's two main energy sources that we have on this planet we have the the core of the earth and the sun so it is way too far away so it is way too far away to get any energy from the sun it's just, the sun is just this bright star here. Pluto is also very small, so it doesn't have a huge core, as huge a core like the Earth has. Although it's speculating, now that we've studied it with a spacecraft, that Pluto does have a rocky, small rocky core. And that rocky core has some radioactive isotopes in it, just like the Earth's core does, that generates heat, just like the Earth's core does. So Pluto itself does generate a very small amount of its own heat due to probably a small rocky core. We have, we have about five more breaths here in the Sphinx, if that's okay. But what we see on the surface of Pluto is a little bit more than some, somewhat what we expect and not expect. So Pluto is made up of it was made up of ices, the same ices that make up all the other Kuiper Belt fragments and objects, methane ices, water, water ice, and carbon monoxide ice, nitrogen ice. So Pluto has areas on its surface that are made of nitrogen ice, methane ice. Pluto has mountains of ice water. So so water ice out in the cold reaches of space where Pluto lives is just as hard as rock. And in fact, in a lot of, in a lot of places, water is the bedrock that makes up so many things out there. Pluto has, Pluto has water mountains the size of the Rocky Mountains. That was a surprise. Another surprise that we found is Pluto has very old regions that, are, that have large impact craters on them but it also has very new regions that have no impact craters 
which means Pluto is actually active. It's geologically active. The chemistry is different, but it's active, which is very, very surprising for a small, cold world out on the edge of the solar system. Okay. We can slowly come out of Sphinx here. So slowly bring your way all the way down onto your belly. You can take your hands and make a pillow and turn your head one way and just rest the side of your head on your, your hands here. Whatever, whichever way you turn your head, slightly bend the knee on that side of the body, drag your knee up kind of at hip height here. This is a slight hip opener, which might relieve some of the pressure that was being generated in the low back in the lumbar during Sphinx pose here. So just stay here for a few breaths. Let your spine neutralize here. And then when you're feeling ready, go make your way up. And kind of flip yourself over gently. We're moving into banana pose here. So the next in posture is banana pose. You'll make your way onto your back. This is where a sandbag might be handy. Now, if you don't have a sandbag, then just don't worry about the sandbag. If you have a sandbag, then it can be useful to kind of keep the hips flat during banana pose. So for banana pose, which is a full body lateral bend, you start out with legs extended out in front. Everything else is kind of lined up nice and relaxed here. And then take the sandbag, place the sandbag over the left side of the hip. And the idea is, is we want to keep the hips level and flat. And the sandbag on the left hip is to encourage the left hip to stay close to the ground. And then take your extended legs and start working them over to the right. So opposite side of the sandbag until they stop, wherever they stop for you here. So you can cross, try to cross the legs here. Doesn't matter really which way you cross them. You can experiment here. And then you work your torso over to the same side. So work your torso over to the right as well, so that you make this bent shape. You make this crescent moon shape. And so you're lengthening out through the whole left side. Then decide what to do with your arms. Arms can be extended overhead, maybe clasp the left arm and slowly tug on that left arm to stretch up through the left shoulder and the left arm here. If that's too uncomfortable, you can always just kind of release your arms or even just keep them down to your side. So that's a little bit of experimentation here. Head and neck should be comfortable here. So in all this rolling around to get into postures, if you ever end up with a kinked head and neck, Give yourself permission to unkink your head and neck. So if there's a position that's more comfortable than the one it's in, then go ahead and move your head and neck there. And then we'll stay here for a few minutes or so. What we discovered when we when our spacecraft flew by Pluto, is that Pluto has a very young region, in it, geologically speaking. This was an extreme surprise because we thought something so small and so cold shouldn't be geologically active anymore. Well, Pluto surprised us. By the way, Pluto is so small that it's only one-fifth the diameter of the Earth. That means it's actually smaller than our own moon. Pluto is only about 1,400 miles across. The Earth is about 8,000 miles across. So you could fit at least five Plutos side by side to, to go across the Earth. So it's, it's Pluto is about half the size of the United States. If you want to get a, a size into your brain here about how big Pluto is. But it turns out there's still active systems, even working on a small cold planet such as Pluto. There's this region on Pluto known as Tambao Regio, and it's this large white heart-shaped region that's very geologically young. 
you look at it, there's very few impact craters in some of the regions. And it looks like there's these frozen convective cells in this region. This region is about the size of Texas, a little bit bigger than the size of Texas. And you can see these, these frozen convective cells on these great plains, young plains, right next to these big high ice water mountains. Now the plains themselves are made up of nitrogen ices with a little bit of methane ice and carbon monoxide ice. And then there's these giant water, water ice mountains that rise next to this, this, this smooth plain that seems to be reconstructing itself. Well, the only way it can do that if there's something warm underneath it. And due to the density measurements that, that the spacecraft New Horizons took, um, it's, it's speculated that Pluto has a rocky core and it has a thick, thick mantle of ice, of water ice, maybe several hundred miles deep. But at some point in the deep interior, that warm rock starts to heat up the water ice and it melts. And they, we think at some depth, the ice actually turns to liquid water. So I think Pluto might actually have a liquid water mantle. And that liquid water slowly gets heated by the warm rock core. And that creates convection cells that slowly churn the ice that's on the surface of Pluto and resurfacing it, which means, which means it's active. Pluto is not a cold, dead world like our moon. It's actually an active world. And that was a complete surprise. Basically what it said is, wow, even tiny little worlds like Pluto are just as interesting as the other major planets in the solar system here. So just one more breath on this side of banana. And then when you're ready, gently make your way back to center, center line. So legs come back, torso comes back, take the sandbag off if you're using the sandbag for a moment. You can just lie here for a moment, or you can make little movements or wiggles. You can draw your knees into your chest. You can maybe do waterfall pose and point and flex your feet a few times. But then we will move into the other side of banana pose. So if you do have your sandbag and you want to use it, take your sandbag and gently lie it across the right side of your, of your hip and then start inching your extended legs over to the right, or left as far as they go, and then your torso over to the left until you're completely stuck. And then you can somewhere, maybe along the right side, you're feeling open here. Arms can extend out overhead. You can lengthen if you want to, if you're trying to continue that whole stretch, if you will, that whole opening on the right side, maybe the right arm is all the way up and then decide where you want to have your head at here. Settle into your banana pose on this side and then we'll stay here for a few minutes on this side of the banana pose and just reside. Just keep track of your head. Just breathe. Just be you for a moment here. Just like Pluto is being Pluto. Pluto has five moons, it turns out. We know about the largest one a long time ago. So Pluto has a moon named Charon. Charon is about half the size, half the diameter of Pluto. Charon orbits Pluto every six, seven, about 6.7 days, which is also Pluto's, Pluto's rotation rate. In fact, Pluto and Charon are, known, are what is known as tidally locked. And what tidally lock means is the same face of each entity faces each other and rotate, orbits each other at the same period. So Charon is fixed over one certain location on Pluto's surface and its orbital period is the same orbital period as Pluto's rotation rate. We know about tidal locking very well. Our moon the moon of the Earth is tidally locked with the Earth. The same side of the moon always faces the Earth. That's what tidal locking actually is. 
and Pluto and Char and are tidally locked. Pluto has four other little tiny moons that are less than 100 miles across. Those are not tidally locked. Those actually spin at their own rate as they orbit around Pluto. So Pluto, Pluto, as small as it is, has its own system of moons. So very interesting, very interesting place. The chemistry and the mechanics on Pluto are different because it's so cold here. It's there, it's only about 40 degrees above absolute zero on, on Pluto. And so where we're used to having water in the form of liquid and and vapor. In the realm of Pluto, water is almost always just rock hard ice, except, except in the center of Pluto, where there might be oceans. Maybe another, maybe another minute here on the side of banana, if that feels appropriate. Doesn't feel appropriate. Give yourself permission to come out. So this theory that Pluto has a rocky core that's warm or even hot because of the radioactive elements in it. And by the way, that's very natural for all bodies to have, like the Earth, like the other planets. And the fact that there might be a, an ocean of liquid water right next to this hot rock makes astrobiologists very interested, very excited, because in astrobiology, they study what conditions do you need to, to harbor life elsewhere in the universe. We know what we, well, we only know of one planet that has life, and that's our own. But they speculate that some of the ingredients that you need for life are hot rock in contact with liquid water, because that's what we have here on Earth, and that's what's speculated where life started on Earth, is, is with with water in contact with the hot, hot surface rock of the Earth. Well, that could be happening on Pluto. And if it is, the astrobiologists say, well, there you go. Even Pluto has some of the characteristics that you need to harbor life. So they're now very interested in Pluto. We, we all totally expected Pluto to be a totally dead world and it's turning out to be way more exciting than we ever expected it. However, maybe, maybe we need to come out of banana pose here. So first, coming out of banana pose, bring yourself back to center. You're done with the sandbag. So if you were using the sandbag, you can take it off to the side. We're finished with it. Again, maybe some little counter exercises here for banana pose. And then slowly, maybe bring yourself up to seated for a moment, just to move around. So our next, the next in posture is known as snail pose. Now I'll say snail is not for everybody. So there will be an alternative for snail pose. So I'll demonstrate snail. And then if you're looking at this and saying, okay, maybe not today, then dragonfly pose will be an option and I'll demonstrate that when I get done with snail pose. So snail pose is probably one of the more intense forward folds that you can do in yin yoga. So if you're someone who shouldn't be folding forward, then maybe you want to skip, maybe you want to skip snail. Here. So snail pose is the yin cousin of plow pose. So you start on your back. I'm actually going to take a blanket here place a blanket here for a little bit of extra padding underneath my shoulders. Lie on your back, maybe have some padding underneath your upper torso, maybe even your head and your neck, even though my head and neck are off the padding because this is, I need this mainly for my shoulders here. And then what you will do is you'll, maybe arms are lengthened out to the side, press your palms into the ground and you're going to move your legs and your hips up over your torso here. As far as they go until they stop. Now for some of us, maybe the legs just end here. Maybe they make it to the ground. Knees don't have, legs don't have to be straight. So knees can be bent here. And then you're kind of stabilizing yourself with your hands and your arms here. So this is, this is snail pose here. And you can stay here for as long as you wish. 
maybe for some of you this is a comfortable position, maybe for some of you this is pretty awkward, but it's not painful. Maybe for some of you this is painful. So the alternative to snail pose is dragonfly pose. So slowly bring yourself out of snail. Come to a seat, maybe sitting on some padding, some height, legs extended out in front, and then bring your legs wide. So dragonfly is a hip opener. By the way, knees can be bent and you can even have padding under the knees if you need to. And then you fold forward in dragonfly. So just like in half frog pose, we're just folding forward kind of centrally here, just as far as you go and you can put props underneath your torso as you need them. So this is a nice alternative. You're getting your forward fold and you're getting a hip opener with dragonfly. Otherwise, if you found snail to work for you, then come back to snail pose. And the idea is it's a pretty intense forward fold. So if there's any pose that kind of resembles a hibernation pose, maybe it's this one because you're all curled up and it also kind of looks like what it's called. You're really all just curled up like a snail here. And we'll stay here. We're about halfway through this pose. So we'll stay here for a few more breaths. So the thing about this pose is it's pretty intense and it can be intense up in the sh in the neck region here. And with this pose, it always kind of, kind of keeks my trachea a little bit which means it gets hard to talk when I'm in this pose here. Although I still seem to be managing here somewhat here. So Pluto, Pluto was discovered in 1930 by a man named Clyde Tombaugh. Now Tombaugh actually grew up on a farm in Kansas. So he's a bit of a farm, farmer, a bit of a farm boy, but he got very, very interested in astronomy. In fact, he made his own telescopes from old farm machinery. And he was lucky enough to, at one time to get a job working at the Lowell Observatory in Arizona. And that's where he started searching. He started studying star plates. And he would take exposures from stars every night, and then he would compare the two and he found something moving among the stars. And when, upon further investigation, they realized it had the characteristics of a planet. And so it was dubbed the Ninth Nine Planet, and that label stuck for 70, 80 years ever since then. And there's a little bit of national pride involved because it was the only planet in that an American had discovered. So I think, I think the United States was really proud of the fact that they had someone who discovered a planet here. So maybe one more breath and then slowly, slowly unwind from snail pose or slowly come up from dragonfly pose here. And then from here, We'll do a little bit of, the counter pose is actually a, a core engaging posture known as the hinge maneuver. So if you were using props, maybe clear them, come onto your back here. Bend your knee, bend your legs and then stick your legs straight up in the air, just in a waterfall pose here. Arms to your, onto your side, engage the muscles in your core. So this is a young exercise. And then very slowly lower your extended legs down to the floor. Maybe take two breaths or so before they reach, reach the floor here. And then bend your knees, roll over onto one side, bring yourself up. And then we'll move on into the next yin postures. The next yin postures are a couple of shoulder openers and you can try to do this I usually demonstrate this without a bolster, but some of us might find it useful 
to have some height underneath our torso. So if you have a bolster, or if you have some firm blankets or firm pillows, maybe have those handy to put underneath your torso. So it's called bow tie pose. And there's also other alternatives for bow tie. And since it's a pretty intense shoulder opener, we won't be here for very long, maybe two minutes on the side. So this is what bow tie looks like. You look onto your belly, legs extended out behind you, and then arms underneath, elbows underneath your shoulders, just like sphinx pose here. But for bow tie, you'll take your left arm and weave it in between your right arm and your torso and extend it out to the right. Take your left, right arm, extend it out to the left. This is why it's called bow tie here. And then relax and lower your torso onto these extended arms. So this is, this is with no props here. Head can just hang. Maybe you can put a pillow under your head if you want to. So this is, this is the basic shape of bow tie. It might be a little bit more accessible if you lay your belly on a bolster. Now you have a little bit more space. So left arm goes to the right, right arm goes to the left. And there might be this, the, the decrease in pressure might be acceptable now here if you use some pillows or a bolster. Maybe none of that is working. If none of that is working, come to a seated position and you can try eagle arms. Eagle arms are bring the left arm underneath the right, cross above the elbows, bend the forearms, See if you can bring your hands to your shoulders, maybe clasp fingers, or maybe make prayer hands with the eagle arms here. And so find your version of eagle arms, and this is a good substitute for bow tie, which can actually be pretty intense. So intense that I think I'm going to just have you stay here. If you're already in bow tie, just stay here for about another minute or so, if it's not painful here. So Pluto got christened the planet, and it, it had that label for the better part of 70 to 80 years. And then what happened was we discovered more objects in the Kuiper Belt, and we realized that this Kuiper Belt was this vast region filled with objects, of which Pluto was just one, one of the more massive ones. But it fit more into this scheme, this, this region of the Kuiper Belt than it did of the terrestrial and the gas giant planets. So it made sense to scientists to reclassify Pluto as one of these objects in the Kuiper Belt. And this happened in the early 2000s. So it was then that the International Astronomical Union met and they said, okay, we have to have some formal rules as to what a planet is and that's when and so they decided to make make the rules and there's basically three rules a planet has to be something that orbits the sun it has to be big enough that it gravi its gravity pulls it into a sphere and it has to be the gravitational bully of its area of the solar system i.e. it had to have cleared its zone of extraneous debris and it's the third criteria that Pluto um, doesn't manage to make. So it's in among a bunch of other icy particles that have not been cleared out. And so it's because of this third, this third designation. Keep in mind, this is all just made up by humans um, to classify and label things. Um, I like to remind people that... Um, Pluto has never known that it was a planet. It's never known that it's been demoted. Pluto has just been its own thing this whole time here. Slowly make your way out of this side of bow tie. You can roll onto one side. You can move the arms around to get blood circulation here. We have the other side of bow tie to do. So you can either do another version of eagle arms or when you're ready, come back to sphinx pose. And now it's the right arm that goes underneath first, and then it's the left arm that extends on top. So we're switching 
which arm is lower and which arm is higher for this side of bow tie pose. And again, you can do this on a bolster or some pillows, find, find what works for you, or maybe that was enough, that first side, so you can take a break on this side. And then we'll, we'll stay here for another minute, minute and a half, two minutes here. So sink, soften again. Get in touch with where you're feeling this. Feeling this in your arms, your shoulders, shoulder blades, upper torso, maybe head or neck. And kind of get curious. What do you do with planetary and Kuiper belt observation is we're just getting curious. We're not really caring what we find. We're trying to drop our expectations and just really, really notice and explore what's actually there. So this is the tie-in between space exploration and yoga. Space exploration, we're off to some far-flung world and trying to figure, figure, just learn something new about it. No expectations. Same with yoga. We're trying to learn something new. Trying to learn about our stopping points, our stopping points. Great teachers here. And sometimes we have to use words, we have to use labels, we have to use a classification system to somehow characterize what we think is going on in yoga, but also in space exploration. So Pluto was considered a planet because we didn't know of any other Kuiper belt objects out in the solar system. But now we know of over 2,000 Kuiper belt objects and discovering more every day. And not only that, we're discovering that many of them are similar to the size as Pluto. So the ones that are as big as Pluto, if we considered them all planets, then we'd have way more then think about the poor school kids out there that have so many more planets they'd have to learn. Instead of eight planets, now you have 30 planets. 20 years, you'll have 50 planets. Some of them will have really boring names like UGH543J2775 or something like that. So do we really want kids to be learning all of that stuff in school? Or is it a nice thing that they're, now they only have to learn I only have to learn eight planets. Although I suspect even when you're a school kid, you'll still learn about Pluto because Pluto is too interesting of an object to ignore, Sharon. Well, we don't have to ignore bow tie anymore. We can slowly come out of this posture. So again, you might have to roll a little bit to get just started from side to side until you can actually release bow tie pose. That's the last yin posture, a little bit of integration before resting pose. So maybe slowly make your way onto your back, bend your knees, draw your knees in, give them a hug. Maybe, maybe some spinal twists here at the end here. So keep your knees bent in towards your torso and then lower your knees over to one side. Opposite shoulders melting towards the opposite side. And if it's okay with your neck, maybe turn and gaze in the opposite direction of the knees. Arms can be out wide or they can be a cactus arm. You just have to stay here, maybe a couple more breaths. And then slowly bring your knees back up to center. And then lower them over to the other side. Opposite shoulders trying to melt back so that you are in a spinal twist. Same thing with your neck. Maybe your head and neck need to stay neutral here. Or maybe you can make a complete spinal twist by turning your head away from your knees here. And then maybe one more breath here. When you're ready, bring your knees up. Maybe give them one final hug. There's any final movements or postures that you like to do before, before the resting posture, before final shavasana. Give yourself some space to do those for a few breaths. And then, when you're feeling ready for Shavasana, go ahead and settle into your version of Shavasana. I'm going to suggest seated meditation. 
Although you don't have to do that. You can, if you like, just lying on the floor. If that's your favorite Shavasana position, then go ahead and do that. But maybe, maybe you'd like to just sit, find a comfortable seated position. And maybe for this final resting posture, release tension, release strain. So this is very similar to a spacecraft going into deep space hibernation. It's turning off all of the systems that are not useful to it. And that's what we're trying to do in Shavasana, is we're trying to release all the tension, stress, and strain that is not useful to us, so that the mind can rest, so that the body can rest. So head is released, torso relaxed, legs released, arms soft, eyes are soft, jaw is released. See if you can return to the softness of the hibernation mode. And also maybe visualize yourself as Pluto itself. You're this very, very interesting, unique and diverse being in the outer solar system. You're slowly, making slowly orbits around the sun with your family of moons. And for your whole life history, you have never known labels or characterizations. You never knew that life forms on a far flung planet discovered you and labeled you with a name and a title. You actually never knew when you were demoted from that title. You actually never knew because you're too busy being you, your own entity, in your particular portion of the solar system, of the universe, of space, of time. Begin to bring yourself back, begin to wake yourself up from hibernation. Breath can deepen, you can start to make movements with fingers and toes, and then expand that motion up through your arms and through your legs. If you're lying down, then maybe very gently bend your knees and roll over onto one side. Find your there, self there, settle on your side for a few breaths. And give yourself a big thank you for your practice. But also a big thank you for yourself, your unique embodiment in this solar system, in this universe. The universe is ecstatically joyful that you are here. And then gently yeah, bring yourself up to seated. Find a comfortable seat. Maybe you're already there. 
Bring your hands together in front of heart center. I'll end practice with an OM. You can join in or simply listen. The inner light in me honors the inner light in you. Namaste.